Welcome to another Scholar Sage podcast. Yep, it's uh, me again, Damo. Uh, just me on my own today. The other people who often hear on the podcast with me are all off teaching seminars around the world. And, and for a change, I'm actually at home, not teaching uh, at the moment, which is unusual for me uh, to actually, <laughs> actually be at home for any length of time. Um, so I'm on my own today a little bit, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the ghost points. Um, a type of point that's used in uh, Chinese medicine, quite an esoteric uh, categorization of points. I don't want to make this podcast like purely for acupuncturists because I know a lot of people listen to this and maybe Qigong practitioners or, or Tai Chi practitioners or something. So I'll, I'll talk about how it's used, how they're used in Chinese medicine, but I'll try and make it a little bit interesting uh, for non-acupuncturists as well. Um, primarily because I think as well as being a great uh, selection of points that can be used in treatments um, if you're an acupuncturist, but also because uh, I believe they give a kind of um, a great window into the kind of thinking of the culture that developed a lot of these arts. This is one of the sides of Chinese medicine that's not discussed that often. Sort of, uh, You see people do qigong and study tai chi and they think, well, why should I study Chinese medicine as well? Um, because obviously the, there's a link between them, but they, people talk about how you know studying Chinese medicine um, can give you a greater understanding of qi maybe or... Um, or even some people talk about, you know, you have a career that's essentially in a similar field to what you're interested in. So that's a bonus of it. But one of the other bonuses of Chinese medicine is it gives you a great window into the, the belief systems and the cultures um, of this ancient people that formulated these arts. I mean, it's brilliant, you, especially if you go beyond the kind of modern uh, westernized views uh, of how Chinese medicine works. And you actually look at the uh, classical beliefs uh, because the classical beliefs actually show you um, certainly where they were coming from and what their uh, mindset uh, was all about. These people that, you know, were involved in the founding of Qigong and stuff like this. Um, and one of these classical theories that, that's often skimmed over is the ghost points. Um, these these points, um, 13 of them that are sit on the body. Some of them are, on, you know, are repeated either side of your body. Some of them are just on the center line. But essentially there's 13 points classified as the ghost points. So classified by a very famous Chinese doctor from the Tang Dynasty called uh, Sun Samao. Um, Sun Tzu Miao, sorry, who, who was uh, very influential in a lot of uh, Chinese uh, medical practice, and almost anyone who studied Chinese medicine would have heard of Sun Tzu Miao. So, mm. excuse me, having a drink. Uh, the ghost points um, are, are, well, you can already tell from their name, why can't you? I mean, essentially they were designed for the treatment of ghosts. Uh, you know, invasion <laughs> of the body by spirits and spiritual influences. So you can already probably guess, even if you don't know anything about Chinese medicine, that, that a lot of the time these have been stripped out of uh, Chinese medical teachings because we don't believe in ghosts anymore. Or, or the, uh, the general modern view is that to worry about ghosts as a form of sickness is a nonsense. And yet I can certainly tell you that uh, being a, a practitioner, a therapist, a Chinese medicine practitioner, you do get a surprising amount of patients that come in worried about ghosts. It does happen. I mean, that you get a lot of people come in saying um, that they feel that they've got some kind of influence left in them from uh, a ghostly spirit in their house or that they've been possessed or something like that. Um, that might sound strange to some of you, but I mean, there's a, there's a whole spread of views out there. People have all sorts of belief systems. And certainly if you, if you don't believe in ghosts, you're probably actually in the minority across the whole of the planet when you take in uh, to consideration the views of like places like Asia and India and uh, and things and things like this, um, but I do have, you know you do get patients coming in talking about spirits and stuff like that. If you hear people talk about the ghost points now, often they'll say that um, it was because people didn't understand what epilepsy were, was or something like this. So often they're used in seizures or mania or mental illness or something like that. Um, I don't think that's very fair, actually, though, because no, no, that's not what the ghost points talk about. They were literally talking about ghosts. I've even seen some writings where they say Sun Tzu Mao was metaphorically talking about ghosts. And it's like, mm, that's not what I get when I read his writings. You know, there is classical text written left behind uh, by him. Um, and no, 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 he was talking about ghosts. He's definitely talking about ghosts. So <coughs> originally within Chinese medical thought, of course, they blamed everything on ghosts. And maybe that's a little bit too far, you know, but if you go back hundreds and hundreds of years, if you were sick, same as probably in the West, isn't it? I think um, probably in medieval times, a lot of the beliefs were very similar. So if you go far enough back, they believed everything was due to spirits. Um, and that might have been, like I say, a little bit, a little bit extreme. Mm. But they believed that if you got sick, it was uh, some kind of spirit. And then you used to have to have the local, I don't know, shaman or witch doctor turn up and shake a stick over you or, I don't know, stick a spike through a cat and bury it under your house or something like that to appease the ghost or whatever the hell they did. Um, 
and but gradually what happened as time went on uh we started to understand probably globally the ghosts weren't responsible for absolutely everything and actually after a while in chinese medicine you see it start to switch to what they call climatic influences um so they started to believe that the cold and the damp in the environment started to make you sick and um rather than ghosts um and then after this they also realized that your internal uh, condition could make you sick as well basically the the quality of your mind that was probably the influence of taoism and buddhism more than anything else that were traditions that were studying uh, the consciousness and the intellect to to great depth um and they realized that that these were greater causative factors uh, for your uh, health you know um and then gradually what happens they moved away from the idea of ghosts and then ghosts became minor, so uh, they were still had an influence up, upon your health, but they weren't considered the most common form of uh, sickness. So now, instead of always treating ghosts all of the time, what happened was they had a, a smaller treatment protocol for ghosts, and the ghost points were a remnant of this. So they were developed in a time when they already believed, Sun Tzu Mao and his contemporaries already understood um, about the Chinese medicine concepts of damp and heat and, <clears throat> and fire and things like this in the body. Um, but they still had a belief system that ghosts, there was a chance ghosts could uh, affect you negatively, you know. I mean, if you go into Asia now, uh, those of you who have spent some time there, you'll know how important the spirit world still is uh, to a lot of Asian people. I don't know about China so much these days, to be honest. I think the Cultural Revolution had a huge impact. Communism had a massive impact upon uh, China. Um, but certainly in Southeast Asia, I mean, every street corner has a shrine on it to some deity or spirit. Um, and different countries you go to, it gets weirder and weirder. I mean, if you haven't been to Bali, I mean, it, it, you can't walk five minutes without some ghost or spirit or deity needed appeasing in some way by the locals. I mean, I was in Bali and I remember being shocked at just every single day seemed to be a holy ceremony day. You know, and I wasn't used to that. It's like, oh, what's, go oh, what's this procession about? What's going on? Oh, why is all the music so early? Oh, yeah, it's a holy day of this or that. And you think, oh, okay, all right, I'll let them off. Oh, you know, they can disturb my sleep. It's a holy day. Next day, exactly the bloody same. And every single day, every day is a holy day because something's going on. Some spirit needs appeasing. And, and my experience of Asia is that uh, these belief systems of the spirit world and the human world crossing over are still massively prevalent um, all, all across their, their culture. It's a very interesting uh, phenomena to see, especially as someone who grew up in the West, where obviously that's not talked about uh, quite, quite so much, you know. Um, and then, of course, lots of Asian houses have um, family shrines, you know, where they, they leave offerings to the ghosts, essentially, of their ancestors, uh, or whatever, the spirits of their ancestors to help them and things like this. So there's this, this crossover between the spirit world and the physical world. Our world is, uh, is massive, you know. It's only when you come to the West that when you talk about ghosts, everybody goes, oh, God, here we go. You know, it all sounds a bit hippie-ish and a bit uh, fluffy. It's not helped by the fact, actually, is it, that often, to be mean, the people in the West who do talk about ghosts constantly do tend to be a hippie-ish and a bit new age and, and stuff like that. It doesn't help it, I suppose, does it? But, but yeah, it, it's, not, it's not as recognized um, over here. So ghosts in Chinese uh, culture... There was many, many types of them. There were so many different types of ghosts, you know. The, the term is gui, uh, the Chinese word for it. Um, it's about G-U-I in pinyin. Um, and gui, essentially, the Chinese character shows a sort of uh, this disembodied spirit uh, sort of floating away, you know. So they were literally, when they say gui, they were talking about what we would understand to be a ghost, uh, as we understand it in Western cultures. Bed sheets over your rattling chains, those kind of things, sort of. Uh, what's that? Christmas thing, uh, Christmas Carol in it, Scrooge and all that. You know, they're talking about ghosts in, in that sense. The view being that uh, when a person uh, died, uh, what would happen is for a period of, and the number of days varied, you know, but it was a few days basically, um, that a person's spirit wouldn't necessarily understand that it had died. Um, you know, it's like, oh shit, what happened? And, and the spirit, the ghost was uh, left attached to the dead body for a little while and then after they buried a person then the ghosts would often stay hanging around the bones uh, of the corpse it's kind of an old view you know it took a little while for the ghost to realize it was dead and move on into the transmigration process or something like this and and for this reason they associate ghosts and death with the color white because bones were white 
um, and things like this. So the, the, the gray were these sort of spirits, these sort of remnants. It's like when something bumped you off and you kicked the bucket and that's the end of your time on the, on the earth, on the mortal coil, then the spirit would be hanging around for a little while afterwards, uh, just sort of getting used to the idea that it was dead, you know. And this is why there was lots of um, ritualistic practices, even from uh, the Taoists, uh, even like actually now in China, some places you can still pay um, to have these rituals done. Um, I was quite surprised when I saw it to help your uh, ghost, your Gwei, understand that it had died so that it could sort of move on and do what it needed to do. So how does this fit into the kind of idea of reincarnation? You know, because that's an odd one, isn't it? Because if the spirit gets reincarnated, what is the ghost? Well, it's partially because uh, in in Chinese culture, they believe of many different fragmented parts of your spirit, right? Uh, so, for example, most people who study Qigong will know you have the Po and you have the Hun, or the Po and the Hun, as they're sort of written in English. Uh, and the Po or the Po is listed as your uh, sort of, what do they call it, your corporeal spirit, you know, your yin soul, or if you like. Uh, and the Hun is your ethereal spirit or your uh, yang aspect of your soul. And these two work together, the, the Po and the Hun. So the, the Po... Essentially, when you die, it's the part of your spirit that kind of breaks down and turns into so much like spiritual compost, you know. So when you die, your Po breaks down and returns to the earth, is the idea. And the Po that goes into the earth is in like remulched up, like so much compost, uh, and then recycled back into the next person. But an aspect of your Po hangs around, you know. It's like the bit of your spirit that becomes a ghost. Yeah. The Po is often associated with... Um, sort of ideas of mourning and grief and associated with the element of metal in the lungs which are considered quite a sad organ a very depressed organ wailing all of the time like a ghost so when you when the the pose uh, dies you know it's this grief this mourning this attachment to the earth this inability to let go um, also it's dense nature it's the yin soul it's the dense part of your your spirit uh, that it's because it's so dense, it doesn't move on to the heavenly realm. It just kind of hangs around on the earth being a ghost, you know. So the idea is that uh, when people die, this bit of you is left over. And um, depending on what the nature of your po was, um, you know, what was your karma you'd accumulated, if you like, what was your ming, your destiny, your life path, then your, your po would have a certain quality to it. So a standard neutral po, for example. Um, would just sort of hang around for a little bit trying to figure out <laughs> why it was dead. Oh, shit, I'm dead. And then after a while, sort of break down and dissipate. That's what neutral Poe does. You know, you've got like a temporary bit of uh, existence and then it breaks down like so much mulch and moves on, you know, nothing sacred about it. And then you have a, um, a more negative Poe. So someone who died uh, with a great amount of attachment or suffering uh, to it. So the idea was that suffering and uh, depression and a, you know all this sort of dark heavy karmic goo that people can attach to them creates a kind of density to the way you know it can't let go it's dense it's stuck on the earthly realm so then what happens is when a person dies that kind of soul that kind of spirit gets stuck on the earthly realm uh, and essentially becomes what we would associate with a long-term ghost you know so when you get these stories where people go to battlefields and they sing ghostly soldiers from 500 years ago get up and walk across the battle these are the in Chinese medicine, these would be sort of um, aspects of Po that were very imbued with a negative, dense energy of suffering or mourning or, or shock at their death or something like that. And they're so dense that it's going to take them a really long time to move on, you know. And and it and a lot of um, even old feng shui beliefs in Chinese were essentially uh, to learn how to place the house or your living, your settlements or whatever, in places where these dark, dense souls, these po, these ghosts, couldn't attach to you. You know, they, they, were, they were too far from the houses. You kept the houses away from graveyards or battlefields or places where there'd been a lot of suffering. Um, you know, Indian burial grounds, if you sort of listen, read a lot of Stephen King novels or whatever. They're to blame for everything, aren't they? Every time something goes wrong in an American movie, it's an Indian burial ground. Shouldn't have killed all the Indians. That would have... Native Americans, I apologize. You shouldn't have killed all them. That would have been easier. So then from there, if the uh, you have the other end. So you've got the neutral Po that just breaks down. Then you've got the, the yin Po that sort of becomes all dense and stuck and negative and becomes a ghost. And then you've got the yang Po, essentially one that's very light, uh, very clear and easy death. Maybe there's been the help uh, for someone to pass on um, by making sure they've cleared up all their karmic baggage uh, before they die. Um, or maybe that they were completely content with their death and it wasn't 
a stressful or awful experience not traumatic in any way so there's no density to it so it just immediately moves on you know and, and you can already see how a lot of these ideas that we understand in sort of i guess even modern pop culture and things like that but modern pop culture comes from our classical traditional beliefs doesn't it of of tribal beliefs and things like that you can already see this concept can't you like about the spirit needing to move on and clearing the suffering so it's not attached to the earth and stuff like that i know it sounds like so many movies um but remember movies are based on something i mean they research these things and these are old um you know tribal and cultural beliefs that were reflected across the world and the chinese certainly had this view as well so this is the po um and the idea was that if a person had a po you know, a spirit when they died, a ghost that was left over, then spiritually that was holding them back. So a lot of the um, work during a person's uh, life in alchemy was to harmonize the Po and the Hun, or the, actually they uh, metaphorically refer to them as the dragon and the tiger for various reasons, but they talk about the Po and the Hun. They try to harmonize them so that there is no ghost, you know, there's no anchor back to the earthly realm when you die, because that will stop the spirit elevating to a higher stage. So to leave a ghost was considered a bit of an error according to the spiritual traditions because it means you couldn't attain um, enlightenment so ghosts became quite important to alchemical pra practitioners as well they wanted to understand them and clear them uh, so that they could move on to a better place so the other part of your spirit the hun the yang soul the ethereal soul the lighter you know the other part of it um, this isn't like the Po, it doesn't become a ghost. So the idea is the Hun is like the uh, metaphorical flame that is passed from candle to candle, you know, life to life. So it's a part of your spirit that is involved in transmigration or reincarnation. So when a person dies, they leave behind a sort of Po remnant, uh, and then the Hun aspect the higher aspect of their soul uh, is then fed onto the next life and onto the next life and this is where a lot of the beliefs of reincarnation come from it's curious especially within Taoism as well that they don't believe in uh, and usually there's there's traditions that were influenced by other religions as well but pure Taoism doesn't believe in uh, like one yang soul that becomes another soul that becomes another soul so you, it doesn't really believe in that sort of um, direct life to life to life thing that people associate with reincarnation what they actually believe is that you're made up of three huns three souls um, and when you uh, die these break up and mix with others and then come back together so you have this kind of collective pool and you receive three souls so what it means is your life was built made of three previous existences and the existence before that was a composite of three previous existences and so on and so on so you've got this kind of mixing of all human spirit and souls um, going on and these souls these yang souls are attracted to each other via um, the idea of resonance and harmonization so uh, three sets of Hun with similar experiences, maybe different, you know, direct literal experiences, but similar karmic resonances will attach to each other uh, to form a new life. So there's a far more of a collective idea in the idea of reincarnation within Taoism than, the, than a very sort of individualistic uh, transference from one to another. Curiously, though, all of that was all still to be considered trapped in delusion, according to the spiritual tradition. So even though they said that the Hun could cause you to reincarnate from life to life to life, if you did, you were still deluded. <laughs> because you could only reincarnate if there was a certain amount of attached karma that was causing your, uh, your Ming rebirth cycle, your life rebirth cycle to carry on existing um, because life itself was a delusion so if a person could free themselves of delusion then the Hun would not uh, reincarnate uh, the flame would not be passed on to the next candle and instead it would elevate to a higher thing a higher aspect of spirit that could take them in Taoism to the heavenly realm but you know what that means who knows you know so but these uh, these are complex ideas you know and there's you could probably do a whole podcast on just several of them just on the ideas of the sort of after what happens after death according to Taoism and things like this what karma is and the sort of nature of Ming but but ultimately these are just basic ideas to help you understand what a what a ghost is what a spirit is so um Po interestingly the the Po type ghosts neutral ghosts were essentially meant to be um non-sentient so if you have a neutral ghost it, it doesn't really have an intelligence to it uh, so what happens is it tends to replay like a little bit of karmic resonance over and over again so it reminds me almost like a video cassette an old video cassette stuck on a loop so it's just playing the same thing over and over again it's not really aware of what it's doing it's just playing an old recording a little bit of sort of karmic playback with a bit of interference playing over and over so this is why um, if you look at what people describe when they talk about ghosts what do they say well there's a spooky old house and every full moon or whatever i don't know you see the old lady in the white dress walk up the stairs 
you know you hear i'm sure you've heard those kind of stories about ghost houses oh yeah every full moon you hear her walk up the stairs why is she always walking up the stairs you know, why always the same thing why is she not do, why is she not making a cup of tea on this month for the next month she's kicking the cat or whatever i don't know she's always walking up the stairs. you know i mean she's repeating the same pattern this spirit over and over the reason that the spirit is playing the same pattern over and over again is because the spirit is not sentient. So the spirit doesn't know you're there. The spirit doesn't know it's there. The spirit has no concept of such things. It just so happens to be playing back a little bit of sort of karmic memory of that time when she's walking up the stairs or whatever she's doing. I don't know if that makes any sense, but hopefully what I'm trying to get at is it's just like a little bit of interference between the spirit world and the physical world that's just replaying normally on certain phases of the moon full or dark moon depending on the type of spirit it's more dominant um, because different phases of the moon affected uh, the heavenly and spirit world in different ways so the crossover uh, the, the gap between the well the physical world and the spirit world was smaller on certain phases of the moon which is why you get these stories coming up so when people get frightened of these kind of spirits they shouldn't because there's no sentience to it it's just playing a loop but then what happens is if you get the other kind of spirits that are very dense filled with the suffering and attachment and, and depth to them you know that density that makes them a yin type poe, a yin type ghost then they do have the potential to have a certain degree of sort of i don't know about sentience they don't feel intelligent but you know they have a kind of they have a desire to them something they want and often what that spirit wants is to attach to uh, a living hun in order to create that balance between hun and po once again so that means essentially that they can start to attract to and affect human life so these yin dense souls then can start to cause problems uh, for living beings and this is the root of why certain types of spirit can affect human life so do you believe all that it doesn't really matter to be honest it doesn't even matter if i believe all of it you know who cares because basically whether you believe it or not that was the belief system of the people that founded these traditions and if you want to understand them the art you need to understand the mindset of the people that, that it came from and ultimately this is what they were talking about so this was what a ghost was to them and this is where their formation of the ghost points come from um i never thought i would use them the ghost points in uh, in my chinese medicine treatments i really didn't i thought where am i gonna use a fucking ghost point i don't know i thought i'd be just treating frozen shoulders and bad back and shit like that but nope actually you do get people who they want treating on that level and uh they do they do come into play you know you do use them more than you might think especially because life is weird and if you open your mind up to okay there's a potential of me using these points then patients start coming in requesting that kind of treatment it's just the way life works it's very weird interesting life is interesting but weird i don't understand how so many people find life mundane I mean, I just think they need to open their mind a little bit, and you'd be surprised. Open your mind, and life changes. It gets weird. You know, it starts throwing things at you. They're a bit bizarre. If your life's mundane, try changing the way you think. You'd be surprised. It'll get very weird, and then you'll wish it went back to being mundane again. I think. Oh, mm. sorry, off topic. I'm rambling. I do apologise. Let me have another drink. Downside of being on my own, every time I have a drink, you get dead air. <laughs> I need a little uh, crickets noise while I drink. So, ghost points. Uh, excuse me, sniffing as well. I think I don't know if it's hay fever or if I'm just fighting off a little bit of a sniffle. I'm not. I'm not sure. I feel okay, but I've got a little bit of sniffle. So, if I sniff um, on the mic, I do apologise. Probably sounds awful, doesn't it, through the microphone? Um, right, ghost points. Yes. So that's the external types of ghosts. Um, there's another type of ghost as well, um, an internal ghost. God, it's getting complicated, isn't it? It always does, doesn't it? So the external gui is what I talked about, like a type of spirit that invades the body. Um, and we'll look at how that affects people in, in a little while. But then you also get internal ghosts. Um, so internal ghosts are ghosts essentially created inside you. Um, and essentially, that doesn't mean they're ghosts. It's not ghosts as we would think it, you know, white sheets, rattling chains and whatever, throwing your saucepans around in the kitchen. What we're talking about um, is a type of whew, a sentience, an intelligence that you give to a part of yourself. Hmm, what does that mean? Um, okay, easy, an example. Say I've got this great uh, resentment for somebody in my life, maybe an ex-partner or a parent or a friend, I don't know, someone who's really pissed me off. And I've got that anger replaying over and over and over in the, your mind. And maybe you've had this in your life at some stage or you've known someone who's had this problem that someone can become obsessed with a sort of hurt that someone's caused them or a perceived hurt or something like that. So you've got this rage going around inside their head, you know. And, and it, it goes beyond logic. 
You know, it's like you, you're talking to your friends and you're, why are you still being angry about that? It doesn't mean that was fucking years ago. Get over it. And it's no, no, they're still a bastard. You know, that mind's going round and round. And what happens is after a while, your mind starts to feed that emotion um, so much that it's almost like it starts to give that emotion like a sentience. It's like it gives it a life. It's like you're creating a manity or a, 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 an individuated aspect of your mind has been created by you. And the weird thing is after a while, once it becomes there and it's so dominant, it's almost like a defense mechanism for the brain. It will create like a schizophrenic break. It will create that click in your mind. And then it will become an entirely separate piece of consciousness that you then start to personify and i've seen i've known people do this many many times so they'll be angry about something this deep hurt that's been there for ages and ages and they fed it so much that after a while it splits and it becomes a separate part of their being and then they almost start talking about it like it's a separate person you know so all oh, the anger's back or there's angry me or oh, that angry part of me is overtaking me or i've been lost control to my angry part you know what i mean that kind of terminology and you see what they're doing is they're talking about their anger in the third person yeah so that, that so essentially what happens is they've created a internal ghost a spirit and then what happens is that starts to overtake them because the mind is powerful and in your mind in your consciousness your psychology if you create this split and you personify a part of your brain then it can start to take over and you become self-possessed by that part of your mind and then essentially your none ghost part of your mind can be eradicated by the ghost mind until you're completely overtaken by the anger i don't know if i explained that very well but essentially it means you've given enough energy to a negative mental state that it's overtaken you and you essentially become self-possessed by your own emotional fuck up basically and that's an internal ghost you know and we can do it with all sorts of things we can do it with any kind of trauma um or any strong emotional state uh, especially anger we're very good at anger at doing that aren't we very good at personifying anger it's a very powerful emotion so we're very good at giving it that that side of us you know giving it a life giving it the power to take us over i'm very good at talking about it in the third person uh, definitely you know oh the anger's back or like it's out of your control like it's not a part of your your mind it's another mind you know and these internal ghosts could also be treated through the ghost points as well and you'll see in uh, chinese writings um, that they'll start talking about internal gui and sometimes we read that and they talk about internal ghosts that's what they're referring to a ghost you've created a bit of your spirit that you've personified to a state that it has a life of its own within your own mind it doesn't mean that it's got a life of its own and it's going to leave you and attack other people but it, it means it can take you over you know it's like a succubus you've created in your own head so these two types of ghosts internal and external ghosts could be treated uh, through the ghost points there was many other ways to treat them but but this was one of their the rationale for it interestingly as well like originally in acupuncture acupuncture the needles were considered equally as important um and 50 percent of the treatment along with moxibustion which if you don't know what moxibustion is um it, it means it's it's um what is it it's mugwort i do apologize it's the herb of mugwort that is burnt uh, to warm the body and and within uh tcm training these days or, or any contemporary chinese medicine treatment they'll tell you that moxibustion is to sort of move blood and chi and warm the body basically to warm to get rid of um, cold and you know the things that is to heat the body up you're burning a herb over over the body or over a needle right so it's obviously going to create warmth um so it's not used quite so much these days uh, by most practitioners some do but a lot of practitioners don't use it as much because uh, the view was that it was used more at a time when everybody was cold all the time so there was no heating and bad housing and stuff like this and now that we have modern heating and things we don't need it as much so moxibustions become less and less used compared to acupuncture um, but that's not really why they used uh, moxibustion a lot of people don't know this is actually mugwort has another very important quality uh, to it, the herb mugwort, was that in the belief system um, of ancient China, mugwort was a, an exorcist's herb. So what they meant by that is that if you burnt the herb of mugs, mugwort, then the smoke that was produced, which is very smelly, if you've ever burnt a, a, a bowl of dried mugwort, it's incredibly stinky, quite a nice smell, I suppose, but very thick, very heady, very intoxicating. It's a bit sort of halfway between cannabis and tarragon i suppose i don't know it's a weird weird smell to describe but when you um burn it some of you will think that's a weird description 
halfway between cannabis and tarragon. Is that an odd description? Maybe it is. I'm not sure. But that's kind of what it smells like to me. But I don't have a great sense of smell, to be perfectly honest. Um, but when you burn it, it was said to sever the connection between the spirit world and the physical world. So part of the reason that moxa was used so much was because originally in acupuncture, when they believed everything was caused by ghosts, you got sick, it's a ghost. You got a cold, you got a ghost. Bang your knee, fucking ghost. They did it. When they believed everything was due to ghosts, then they would burn mugwort to sever the connection between uh, you and the spirit world. So yes, it did create warmth, but also it was a, a herb for that. So if you go into, um, especially in some parts of Southeast Asia, some Malaysian regions and things like that, if you go into Chinese temples and they're doing a cleansing ceremony, much like in the West, we might smudge with sage or something. Not that I've ever done that, so I don't know how to do that. Smudge things with sage, what's that all about? But much how we might do that in the West, um, or some people do, hippies, uh, they will actually cleanse a temple of negative spirits using mugwort so most people are familiar with incense smoke being burnt in temples but in some parts of southeast asia they'll burn whole bowls of dried mugwort because the thick smelly tarragon cannabis thick smoke that fills the room uh, burns away the connection between the physical world and the spirit world so that the temple is um purified of ghosts you know to, to make sure there's no possessions part of the reason they want to do this is because they know that uh, or the belief system is that the spirit world is attracted to certain things and one of the things that the spirit world is attracted to um, is reverence and prayer and um, any spiritual practices so if you have a temple where everybody's going in and worshiping and essentially opening up a part of their spirit to a higher power um, then even though they might be aiming for something a little bit higher than a ghost, it's almost like the mind is open to invasion by spirits. So they need to burn and cleanse the temples with mugwort smoke uh, to make sure that the ghosts stay away so that when people come in the general public to pray and worship at the altar or whatever they do, give their offerings, that they're safe from the ghosts that might be in their area. You know, uh, So again, a lot of these things might sound strange to some people, but remember, it's important to understand the mindset of the people that these arts came from. Um, I, too often these days in Tai Chi and Qigong and Chinese medicine, people will scoff at ancient beliefs and then ignore them. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, don't, don't you understand the importance of history? If history wasn't important, we wouldn't study it. There's a reason why we understand, why we have to understand why certain things that happened historically have affected modern culture. So when you study Western culture, we study everything from our um, royalty through to, in England anyway I suppose I don't really fucking bother it's a bit mundane or whatever but you know you study that and you study the political you study all the wars you study slavery you study whatever you know you're studying all of the things that historically have led to the current point partially so you can understand how we got to the current point because if you understand the root of something you can understand more about the nature of a current situation um, and it's the same with something like Chinese medicine. If I want to understand Chinese medicine, I need to understand the history of, of how it came about. And I'm always shocked by how many Chinese medicine practitioners don't know the history of the different eras within Chinese medicine, or even the impact that the Cultural Revolution had upon Chinese medicine. I mean, any sincere Chinese medicine practitioner should have at some stage taken themselves away and studied the literature of the Cultural Revolution, what it actually was, and the politics that led to it, and what the Red Army was about, and Mao's vision, and things like this, because it's a historical thing that has impacted current Chinese medical beliefs. Um, and if you haven't done that, and you're a Chinese medicine practitioner, and you listen to this, I highly recommend you go away and do it, because you'll be surprised how much insight you can have to the current state of Chinese medicine. You just study the history, you know, go away and look. And these days, I'm ranting now, aren't I? I don't understand how people haven't studied these historical things because everyone's carrying around with them a telephone that, that's got access to the internet, which essentially means you've got all of that information at your fingertips. And still people haven't taken the time to sit down and look and just look at the kind of historical background to things and understand the people where something comes from. If you want to like make you the depth of your knowledge greater, look backwards. That's always been the Chinese way. You know, it doesn't mean you have to adhere to the past or cling to it, but you should understand how it works. So even if you don't believe in ghosts, or you don't want to bring ghosts in your treatment, fine, no problem. Like you just want to be a musculoskeletal treat. There's nothing wrong with that or, or whatever. But but at the same time, it can be useful to understand the belief system so you can understand where things uh, come from. And I've seen lots of uh, Chinese medicine books talk about point name. Funk, you know, why is this point called this? Or why why do we have this name for this? Um, and often they've got it completely wrong. Um, there's a book, for example, called, um, 
I shouldn't say negative things about books out loud. It's an old book, so the author's probably dead, aren't they? So I think it's all right. But it's called, what's it called? Um, Grasping the Wind. And it's a book that's got the list of all the acupuncture names and why the names have those names. So it goes through them and talks about the story. Most of them are completely wrong. Um, it's incredible. The vast majority are completely wrong. And the reason they're completely wrong is because the authors, I hope they're, I hope they're not around anymore. They're not listening to this. If they are, I apologize. You did your best at the time. But the reason the point names are wrong is because they didn't understand the alchemical background to the belief systems that created the point names. So a lot of the point names, they take them too literally or they thought they were just sort of geographical uh, hints at where the points were, but they weren't. They were discussing a history and a belief and a, a philosophical standpoint of the people that formulated uh, this art. You know, So awful shame that these get missed. And I'm sorry, I'm off topic, aren't I? What was I talking about? Oh yes, mugwort. Burning things, get rid of ghosts. Burning things? No. Burning mugwort in the temples to get rid of ghosts. <laughs> mm. So, ghost points. What are they? 30, 30, 13 points on the body, you know, that needles could be inserted into. I think they do need needles as well. Because often you've got things like shiatsu or acupressure. Uh, and mo and aspects of twain are and stuff like that that um, can stimulate the points with your fingers or your thumb or, or your elbows I suppose on bigger ones you know and manual pressure I think that's okay for most things but I don't think it's going to work on the ghost points I think the ghost points really do need needle insertion I've often um, come a cropper when I've you know banged heads with shiatsu practitioners particularly because I think shiatsu is wonderful I think it's brilliant and I think if, if a shiatsu practitioner is good um then if you don't know shiatsu, by the way, it's, it's um, God, shiatsu practice, you're going to be unhappy with this. It's essentially Chinese medicine without using needles. So they're using finger pressure and, and working along channels and into points uh, to stimulate them using the hands primarily, you know. And I think it's a great uh, therapy. Therapeutically very good. And I think their quality of touch tends to be better than acupuncturists, obviously, because they work with the body a lot of the time. But there's certain things they just can't do, um, and that's because you do need to have needles inserted into certain points. And the ghost points are some of those, basically. You do need needles. So, so once again, that's nothing against shiatsu. I want to make that very clear. I have a lot of respect for it. It's just that, you know, different tools for different things. So ghost points, these points on the body, um, in all cases apart uh, from one, actually, they're, they're, exist they're pre-existing points on the body. Um, so apologies if you're not an acupuncturist, but just to uh, summarize uh, these points for people who are, uh, you can find them online anyway, easily enough, or in a book, but they're do 26, lung 11, spleen 1, pericardium 7, bladder 62, do 16, stomach 6, ren 24, pericardium 8, do 23, ren 1, um, large intestine 11, and then an extra point that kind of uh, corresponds uh, to Yu Yu and Jing Jin under the uh, tongue, but it's, it's a little different. That's 13, isn't it? Yes, that's the 13 ghost points. So they are points that exist, pre-existing pre points on, on other channels, um, but they're used a little differently uh, in the case of, uh, of the ghost points. And basically what happens is ghost points are selected according to an inherent energy within the patient um, that's that's predetermined and then they're also used symptomatically uh, as well so i don't want to make this too chinese medicine-y because like i said at the beginning there's people that um, aren't chinese medicine practitioners who'll be listening to this so i'll make this brief um, but I think also interesting culturally as well. What happens when you use the ghost points is that everybody has one of those 13 points that is considered their inherent point for accessing their connection to the spirit world, basically. Uh, that's kind of what goes on. So you've got 13 points. Um, and one of those points will be your point. And this point, one of these 13, will be stimulated with a needle. A needle will be inserted. Uh, into this point, uh, neutrally, not tonified or anything, not, not played with, just simply inserted very, very gently into the channel uh, to cause your body to understand and your mind, more importantly, oh, I'm accessing the spirit world. And part of the reason that works um, is because the view is that the mind and the body are connected um, and the mind sort of reaches into the body. I know that sounds odd, but your mind reaches into your body through the channels of Chinese medicine. That, that's the idea of how it works. So it reminds me like this. If you take the brain and you were to lift it out of the, 
the body, which would be a bit gross. And then underneath the brain, attached to it, you have the nervous system. It would look like a giant squid, wouldn't it? You've got sort of the brain and this sort of squid system coming out of it, you know, of the spinal nerves and all the lim- nerves of the limbs. And you've probably seen that kind of chart within anatomy books. And it's kind of like the brain, obviously the brain sends signals via the nervous system into the body, right? Now, the if you were to imagine that, I know it sounds a bit odd, as the channel system, as well, like an energetic version of. It's kind of how the channels work. So instead of the brain, you'd have the upper dantian and the seat of consciousness. And then reaching out of the upper dantian and the seat of consciousness, like so many tendrils, you'd have all of the energetic channels. So it would look very similar. So what we have is the upper dantian. So the brain has the nerves that reach into the physical body, and the upper dantian has the channels that reach into it so that the energetic aspects of the mind can connect with the body so that the channel system is the um, go-between between between the mind and the body or that's how I view it so I view the channel system as like a big energetic squid that is lifted in and out of the body if you like so what happens is when I needle certain points it sends a feedback system back through the channel system to the upper dantian uh, that causes a change inside the mind this is why they say that a good acupuncturist will essentially needle the spirit rather than the body Um, So what do we mean by that? So if I take a needle and I insert it into the body roughly or with a bit of a weird angle or I sort of bang the body or I use a guide tube, definitely, because that's got a bit of a sort of kick to it, isn't it? Like a twang, like you flick it in. Then what happens is the the roughness of the needling is quite abrasive, you know, and that what happens is the body reads the information from that needle oh, into the nervous system. He wants to do something in the physical body. So then the needling only affects the physical body. That's what happens. But if the needle is slipped in and it just slides into the flesh ever so gently and it just doesn't disturb the nerves, it doesn't cause pain, it doesn't cause any mechanical pressure into the fascia system, it just slides on in like Butcher Ding's knife from the Changzhou classics, you know, just slides on in, then it can bypass the physical body and when it touches the channel, then it sends information instead of through the nerves into the brain, it sends uh information through the channel system up into the upper dantian to affect the spirit so this is why they say that the the better acupuncturist treats uh, the spirit within the chinese medicine classics so i bypass the body go straight to the upper dantian and create that change this is where the skill of inserting the needle has to come into i slide the needle past the physical body penetrate past all of the nerves without hitting it and boom straight into the straight into those channels that come out of the spirit you know and there's certain every point on the body has a certain relationship to the mind body system so if i can needle the point the ghost point that corresponds for me to that part of my spirit that understands a connection to the spirit world then when i put it in boof, then my mind opens to the spirit world it doesn't then create change necessary it just means i'm open to that kind of treatment and then further ghost points are put into the body according to the symptoms uh, to then create that change um, hope that makes some kind of sense. So if I were to put in needles into ghost points that with symptomatic thing, you know, like, I don't know, I want to put in a point that affects mania or something like that, and I hadn't already opened the mind to the ghost realm, then all I will do is create a change in the physical body. So some of the ghost points, well, all the ghost points, all of the ghost points have uh, correspondences to existing points. So, for example, one of them is large intestine 11, which sits on the elbow, right? So if I just insert large intestine 11, it won't be a ghost point. It'll be a standard large intestine point on the elbow. I just put it in. Um, so what it'll do, well, large intestine 11 is very good for taking heat out of the body, so it might reduce the thermal properties of the body if I put it in. But if I put my inherent ghost point in first, somewhere else in the body, and I've managed to successfully touch that part of my mind that opens me up to the quality of the spirit world, then when I insert large intestine 11 afterwards, it's different. Now it doesn't have the quality of sort of reducing heat in the body or whatever large intestine 11 might be used for. Instead, what it then does is start to affect its ghost point uh, function instead. Um, So then you get a different reaction from the point and a lot of acupuncture is used like that this is why needle combinations are very very important because how they're combined will change what they do you know this is this is a part of acupuncture i find uh, really fascinating you know how can i combine points to create uh, the right changes and certainly or the wrong changes you know i mean certainly when i watch acupuncturists work um even these days you can just go on youtube and watch a treatment you know so you can see acupuncture all over the world and sometimes i almost grimace because i see the points they're putting in and i know that those points they're putting in are going to counter each other 
um, quite often and, and create a different reaction because there's one of the things I had to learn when I was younger and I was learning acupuncture um, before I did a Western degree or anything was I had to learn a contraindication of points against each other. So, for example, if I put in an inherent ghost point, then large intestine 11 won't reduce heat in the body. It'll, it'll instead, it'll affect my connection to the spirit world and so on. And there's loads of these things all over the body um, that means different points can cancel each other out. It's also why um, it's very technical acupuncture and I think... Um, I think very. I think it takes a little while to get your head around, you know. Um, and certainly in the case of the ghost points, I don't want to put the ghost points in with any other points. Only the ghost points. So I put my inherent point in, then I put the other point in, the other ghost point as well. But I wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't try to tonify the kidneys at the same time or anything like. So the body won't understand. So it essentially means that ghost point treatments will have a very few points. So your inherent point. Sorry, I, I try it. Oh, it's got all medical, isn't it? Sorry if you're not a Chinese medicine practitioner. I'll keep it brief. But if, if, you're, if you put the inherent point and you want to know what it is, it depends upon your year of birth. So this is where Chinese medicine gets a bit uh, weird for some people. It's because when you're born, there's certain astrological correspondences, a certain positioning of the planets and the stars that then have an influence upon inherent energies in your body. And this is a basis of astrology and ancient beliefs of how the stars affect us. Um, denser bodies like the moon have very clear effects uh, upon mental state and length of energy in the body, uh, length level of energy in the body. Um, and certainly once you've trained Qigong for a while, you'll know this, you know, like on the new moon, you definitely got less energy than the full moon and things like this because it affects the body in different ways. But also we then have all different placements of the stars. And one model of this is the stems and the branches. Uh, people have argued whether the stems and branches is to do with planetary alignments or something else. But to me, it's actually relationship and positioning of the stars. Um, I think I'll do a podcast sometime in the stems and branches, explain what they are. But essentially, you have 12 earthly branches. Um, and then all of the ghost points apart from uh, one, which is uh, Gui Sang, actually, all of them can be inherent points. Um, and they'll depend on your year. For example, so all I would do is I would work out what the earthly branch was for my year of birth, remembering in China that the year starts in February usually. Um, I work out what my year of birth is, and that year will have a certain branch. So, for example, I was born in 1980, and the earthly branch is Shen. Okay, so Shen basically uh, is is an earthly branch related to Gui Shin. Okay. So Gui Xin is the ghost name for Lung 11. So it means that, so it's on my thumbnail. So it means if anyone was ever treating me for any kind of possession or ghost problems, if you like, if you needed Ghostbusters, they would always insert Lung 11 first because my earthly branch um, correspondence shows that my inherent ghost point is, is Gui Xin, which is Lung 11, also known as Shaoshang, if you use its other name, but Lung 11. So it means that, first of all, any ghost point user would have to put Lung 11 in first, and they'd have to insert it in both thumbs, so I'd have two needles, <laughs> unfortunately, right near my thumbnails, so not very pleasant ones. I'd have to have those inserted first, and then left in for a couple of minutes while my body calms down, gets over the pain of having two needles put in my fucking thumbnails um, and I'd have to come down and just relax and having those two needles in on their own would just start to open my body up uh, to the part of my mind that corresponds to the ghost world sorry I'm making this a bit long-winded aren't I so those points going first then what happens is I start to add in a third ghost point according to the symptoms attached to the ghost points so for example do 26, uh, which sits on your philtrum, you know, halfway between your, your, your nose and your upper lip, you know, right in the center line. Uh, do 26 is called Gui Song, Ghost Palace, or the TCM name is Ren Zhong. So this is, for example, a point that's listed for um, if there's manic behavior or suicidal tendencies or fears uh, of spirits. Um, it's also for people who have things from night paralysis due to ghostly effects or people that wake up in the middle of the night feeling like there's a ghost sat on their chest. Whereas uh, spleen one, gui lei or, or yin bai near your um, toenail on your big toe 
was indicated for anybody who was having ghosts that caused them to shout and rave and shout out loud, sort of mad possessive possession type behavior. So, and each of the 13 points has these very clear uh, signs. So say, for example, it's me, okay? And I feel that ghosts have influenced my life and I keep waking up in the middle of the night. Go with the one we talked about. I wake up in the middle of the night and I keep seeing these ghosts and I feel like one sat on my chest in the middle of the night and I can't move and I'm paralyzed in the middle of the night by this ghost. That's actually not that uncommon. Sleep paralysis. I've had a lot of patients come in and and they're absolutely certain that the sleep paralysis is caused by a spirit sitting on their chest, you know. I mean, it's not that uncommon to to hear that. And you might say it's delusion or personification of a physical ailment, and maybe that's true. Um, But that's certainly their belief system. So if I came in and I I had said that there was a ghost effect to me and I wake up and it was sat on my chest, what I would do First of all, I'd have my inherent needle put in, which would be lung 11. So I'd have two needles stuck in my thumbnails. <laughs> I'd be left for a few minutes to chill out. And then afterwards, they'd add a third needle uh, into Ren Zhong in the middle of the filtrum, halfway between my nose and my upper lip. And that needle would be inserted very, very gently. They want to cause minimal pain and the needle must slide in. And then I'd be left for a period of time just till I got used to having that needle in, till I calmed down, because that's also a bit of a painful one. I got a very horrible treatment, haven't I? Thumbnails and face. I've opened my nose in my mouth. And, and those would go in and I would just be left until I chilled out. And those needles would start to take their effect. After a little bit of time, what would happen um, is you then tonify the third needle, so the needle that, that went in, the one that was for the ghost sitting on my chest, and you either tonify or reduce it according to the time of the day. So yang hours, during a yang period of the day, I would tonify the needles, I would turn them clockwise quite often, um, and, and on yin hours, I would reduce the needle, so I would turn it the other direction, anti-clockwise. Um, And there's a chart for yin and yang hours, basically between 11 and 1 in the morning, it's yang, 1 and 3 is yin, 3 and 5 is yang, 5 and 7 is yin, and so on and so on, it's alternating. And that time would be the time of the treatment. That's it. That would be how the treatment worked. So that might sound strange to some of you. So why is that the case? Why all these weird esoteric um, beliefs around acupuncture, time, you know? Well, you've got to remember that Time was major to the Taoists. Everything was about phases and cycles. All the models of the five elements and yin and yang, everything through to seasons and spirits and life and birth and death, it was all about cycles. They were obsessed with time, you know, because about the transience of things, um, about the fact that nothing was permanent and everything was a, ca- a state of flux. So if within your body, you have certain um, inherent energetic and spiritual qualities, depending upon the uh, time you were born, the time, and this is what the earthly branches relate to. So my inherent ghost point is trying to tap into an energy that was established in my body. Uh, this is the ones by the thumbnails that tap into that inherent energy that was established at my time of birth. Then what happens when the other needle goes in? Um, I put it in, so the one on my face uh, to stop the ghost sitting on my chest and essentially causing me sleep paralysis. And then what would happen is those, needle, those needles would either be tonified during yang hours so that I'm grasping the yang energy uh, that's being cycling because the energy, the chi in the room is cycling in the, in the environment. It's cycling between yin and yang constantly. And during the yang peaks, the point is tonified to absorb some of that yang energy. During the yin peaks, when there's not so much chi, a yin hour, the point is reduced a little bit to, to close it so that I'm not leaking energy during the yin period. So that they're, they're harmonizing the needle usage with the inherent energies at any given time of the day. And part of the reason they want to do this is on treatments involving something like ghosts or the spirit or consciousness or the mind or psychology, these are considered very yang treatments, very um, you know, sort of fragile, delicate treatments. So I'm being ever so intricate with how I interplay the body of the chi with the body of the environment, you know, so it's all very, very technical. And these kind of things should always be taken into consideration with any spiritual treatments or ghost treatments or psychological treatments, whatever. These kind of little inherent qualities of energy during the yin and yang times of the day and, and the inherent yin and yang energy in the body. None of that is so important if I'm treating a frozen shoulder. You know what I mean? It's like if I'm just breaking up some tissue damage or whatever, or I'm, or I'm mobilizing a joint or I'm fixing a lower back or something, it doesn't really matter so much because that's a very dense physical treatment. Um, I'm doing a dense physical thing. The needles tend to be deeper. They need to be controlled a little, little bit more, a little bit more stimulation. But in the case of something like ghost points, it's a very fragile, delicate, yang, heavenly, if you like, treatment. So 
I'm using the subtlety of the inherent energies at every given time, the biorhythms of yin and yang chi to, to create the effect I want. And this is really where the kind of subtleties and the higher levels of acupuncture come in to, to play with it like that, you know. So these ghost point treatments, you know, would then often be combined with different things. So if I might, so for my, you know, for my, um, what have I got? I forgot what the example I used was. Oh yeah, sleep paralysis. So I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I'm born in 1980, so I've got my inherent point on the thumbs and I'm waking up in the middle of the night with a ghost sat on my chest feeling oppression I need this ghost clears essentially I want a kind of minor exorcism to get this ghost off me um, so I have the the face the philtrum needled and I have the corner of the thumbnails um, and then what I might have is uh, moxa burnt after this not in a not like sometimes you see moxa in like cigar shapes or something have you ever seen that they burn the sort of cigar of mugwort over you but actually what you do is you burn mugwort in the room that I sleep in uh, not while I'm sleeping because Oh, okay, no, you won't be able to breathe. You have to really sort of open the windows and air <laughs> the smoke out afterwards. But moxa would be used in the room rather than on me uh, to burn the connection between the spirit world and the physical world in that place. So what I do is I fill a bowl, um, sort of, you know, maybe smaller than a breakfast bowl, maybe like a Chinese rice bowl that you get in a restaurant, that kind of size, you know. Smaller than a breakfast bowl, isn't it? Yeah, a little Chinese rice bowl. And you, you would um, fill it with dried... Uh, mugwort, what they call moxa punk, if you buy it online from a Chinese medicine supplies, and you fill it up and you set fire to it, and it creates a thick smoke that you put all over the room. Um, that you you know you have in the sleep paralysis and or whatever whatever room is logical for the for the spirit world. Um, and then afterwards, I open the windows and clear out the room, and I have the treatment with the needles, and that's how the moxa and the needles are used together to uh, eradicate that that problem. You know. You then have, you know, on top of this, there's all sorts of other points used for effect in the spirit world. You have Sussen Shong, the upright spirits, which actually means protection from spirits. Um, you have extraordinary channel treatments for effect in this. You have oh, there's so many different things. Like exorcism is a whole school of thought and spirit treatments in uh, classical Chinese medicine. There's also treatments for helping somebody when they're near death to help them move on. There's ritualistic practices to help the spirit move from one world to the next. It's mad, man. This it's so much of it so maybe i'll i'll go through the ghost points individually a little bit we'll have a little bit of a um a little bit of a look at them i think that they can be quite interesting to to see hopefully this isn't too bad for non-acupuncturists i'm trying to make it so it's kind of a cultural lesson as well i guess and once again i just want to highlight like if this isn't your belief system you don't believe it like that's okay it's no problem i'm not saying you have to like it doesn't really matter um but again historically to understand the mindset of the formula people who formulated the arts i think very wise i see that in all the other arts i see it in tai chi as well there's so many alchemical things in in tai chi or things that came in tai chi because of the belief systems of alchemy and that and the philosophy of Taoism that people are ignoring these days because they think it's hocus pocus and nonsense and maybe it is hocus and pocus and nonsense who knows but i don't believe it is personally i think it's really important but it was the belief system of people that formulated it so you need to understand what it is you know so the first one Gui song um ghost palace or, or renjong do 26 sits on the filtrum and like I say that's for sleep paralysis primarily i'll just go down them then you've got the th ones on the thumbs Lung 11, uh, Shao Shang, but also called Gui Xin, uh, purity or whatever of the ghost, ghost purity it means. This is for um, people who do what they call mad walking. <laughs> I like that, isn't it? That's a great description, is it? Mad walking. What it means is like spirits are affecting them so badly that they pace madly up and down. It's like, it's interesting. I used to work in mental health for a little while in social services um, and mad walking was certainly something you saw a lot. As soon as people were having a sort of psychiatric break, mad walking would come out. You know, you remember, I remember going to visit them and you couldn't get in the sit still for a second and they're just burning up all this energy walking around all over the place. How I would have put two needles in their thumbs... I have no idea, but that would have been a challenge in its own right, trying to get them to sit still for long enough for that while they're having a psychiatric break. But lung 11 was indicated um, for this. It's also interestingly listed for ghosts that are causing a draining of your essence from a distance. That's kind of cool, but evil, isn't it? It's like a long distance vampire. So if there was a type of ghost that was causing people's jing, their essence to be depleted um, distance wise, uh, then, then this needle... Uh, this point could be needled as well to break that connection so they couldn't access you. No, I don't know how common that is. I don't know. I do. So next one, spleen one, uh, yin bai. It's on your uh, big 
toenail. I think I mentioned that one, didn't I? Yes, on the corner of your big toenail. Another one that's a little bit unpleasant to have needles. You know, there's a few sharp ones near the toenails and thumbnails. It's called Guele, ghost heap uh, in um, ghost points, because ghost points have separate names for like alternative names to the points. So this is for people that like, say, I said earlier, yeah, I remember shouting and raving uh, because of uh, possessions. It's also if there's um, so a lot of anger and rage, so the ghost is causing them to be angry and, and raging. So this might be relevant to someone with the uh, internal ghost that I was talking about, even that example where they've had so much anger, they fed it, it's become sentient, they've been taken over by their own rage. This would be a point uh, that will help that kind of anger to clear. Well, it's a bit kill or cure, isn't it? It's like they're raging angry, so you put two needles in their corner of their big toenails. <laughs> That'll either make them more angry or shock them out of the anger. Who knows? Take that, you bastard. Two needles in the toenails. So the next one, pericardium seven. It's on your, um, where's that? It's on the middle of your wrist, basically, if you're not a Chinese medicine practitioner. It's sort of between the two tendons on your wrist joint. This is called um, Da Ling, usually in Chinese medicine, but the ghost name is Gui Xin, uh, meaning ghost in the... Ghost in the mind, I suppose. Ghost in the heart mind. So this is ghost a possession that's leading to like switching between laughter and crying, sort of bipolar, up and down, uh, manic depressive type behavior as a result of uh, ghosts' influence, either internal ghosts or external ghosts. Um, it's another one that uh, is used for ghosts that are kind of more at a distance, you know, sort of something that's affecting you from the outside can be very good for that as well. We then have bladder 62. I just go through them quickly, just as a sort of uh, you know reference material for you. Bladder 62, uh, Shen Mai. Um, this is underneath your external malleolus, on the on the outside of your ankle joint, basically underneath the heel bone. Um, Gui Lu, Ghost Road. Um, this is ghost uh, influence of ghosts, also leading to like epileptic. Um, type behavior or, or ghosts that are causing you to switch between health and sickness. So if you think of kind of the old beliefs, isn't it, where someone was sick and dying in their deathbed of a long chronic disease and they said it and they probably didn't understand what the sickness was. It could have been anything from fucking polio or who knows, you know, but a long progressive disease and they said it was ghosts or something like that, mystery illnesses. Um, then bladder 62 might have been one that they used along with the inherent point because they believe this was a the ghost, the long road of the ghost, you know, the ghost road. This was the point they might use to help clear that that sickness next one gui jen do 16 called uh, fong fu it's called ghost pillow is gui jen but fong fu is the normal name for it um, wind pulls uh, this is underneath your occiputs on your neck between the uh, directly below the occipital protuberance on the, on the back of your neck right um, this is it's interesting actually because it's always listed for wind but it's for ghosts that have been carried in um, by the wind that sounds odd, doesn't it? So wind is basically a type of invasion in Chinese medicine, if you're not familiar with it. So if you get a lot of wind on the back of your neck, after a while you can, obviously you've been out walking. You've been out walking on the cliffs in the wind, cold wind, and you get like pain in the back of the neck, and your sort of head feels a bit swollen, you get a headache afterwards, watery eyes, sniffles, things like that. Uh, this is a wind invasion, or one reason for it. Um, but classically they believe that wind used to carry ghosts. So in modern times you have... Uh, modern Chinese medicine, you have the pathogen of wind. Um, but in classical Chinese medicine, you have three types of wind. Um, well, actually, originally you had eight. Okay, we get old enough, eight directional winds. But then there was a period where they believed in three winds. The first wind was wind wind, normal wind, you know, environmental wind. The second wind was emotional wind. So they believed that emotions were contagious from person to person, and they carried over as a form of chi called a pathogenic wind. Uh, this was their old belief. And this probably came from, like, the experiences of, I don't know, if you're with a depressed person, within five minutes you feel tired and depressed yourself. Like, emotions are quite contagious in that way, right? Um, and they believe this was a kind of wind passed in from one person to the other. And then the third type of wind was was wind could carry ghosts into you. So the ghosts would be carried on the wind, and then you could get an invasion from it. And you even see, like, uh, wind being the root of manic type uh, behavior or wind is sometimes linked to um, what do you call it epileptic uh, symptoms and things like this in Chinese medicine this is not often understood why these two are connected but it's a, a carryover of the old belief that wind would carry ghosts into your body and that's why this important wind point uh, do 16 was a a ghost point on the back of your neck under your occiput to help clear the wind type ghosts from you see what I mean like very um interesting i think to look and understand the culture that this stuff come from because even if you don't believe that ghost carries winds into your brain 
<laughs> which sounds like an odd thing to say even, doesn't it? I think it can be good to, you know, it's a real window into how they believed, how, what they thought, you know, and how they viewed life, which is very, very cool. I'm a bit of a history buff for these kind of things. I'm not very good at remembering dates and stuff like that. I don't know. I can't remember the Shang Dynasty from the Tang Dynasty. I've got no idea. But I do find the belief systems at the different uh, epochs of time, different eras, like really, really interesting. I find very fascinating. Next one, Stomach Six. Gui Chuang, this is the, the ghost bed. Um, it's called Jia Chi on the, in Chinese medicine. It's on the corner of your jaw. It's the point that if you've ever been punched in it, you certainly see stars <laughs> on the corner of your jawbone. You get whacked in that, you're out cold, guaranteed. A good punch there, knock you out. Stomach sits on the corner of the jaw. Um, if you put your finger on the corner of your jaw and clench your jaw, that's why I can't talk so I'm clench, where the muscle bulges up on the corner of your jaw, the highest point, that's uh, stomach six. So um, this is a, a point that's uh, used when, like, the ghosts are getting in and causing you have muddled thinking, you know, so any crazy incoherent thoughts, maybe the root of uh, sort of insanity because of ghost possession. And also there was a belief system that sometimes ghosts could show their faces through your face. That sounds weird, doesn't it? So somebody, sometimes a view was a ghost had invaded someone else that when they were in the fit of like possession, their facial features would contort up and you'd see the face of the person who had invaded, you know, the, the sort of, uh, inhabiting spirit, the um, possessing spirit would show its face through yours. And if you could see that, like a sudden change of face, stomach six was used. I've seen that actually, um, because I there's a crossover obviously between mental illness and uh, beliefs of ghosts. And I often wonder, like if you believed in ghosts, um, which I do actually, I mean, I say you don't have to adopt these belief systems, but I should probably say for the purpose of transparency, that this is my belief system. Maybe because I spent so much time in Asia, it's rubbed off on me but I do believe in this um so I actually I do believe and I did believe when I worked in the psychiatric union that some of those people were actually mentally ill and some of them were just possessed uh, which is a slightly different thing and I felt that the people who were mentally ill probably got assistance and the people who were possessed probably didn't get any of the kind of help that they required um, because they were being treated as if they were mentally ill but just my belief, belief system so what do I know but I did see that actually like you would be talking to someone and in the fit of a kind of psychotic episode their whole face would change and contort it was quite amazing like the muscle structure would just completely switch to a whole new pattern faces are so sort of semi-plastic aren't they you know and they store facial expressions which is why whenever you get angry the same lines fire up or something like that it's like I know what my wife's happy face looks like I know what my wife's angry face looks like um, because the same kind of facial features pattern comes up in up in her face because it's plastically stored there. But sometimes, like if someone has an episode of psychotic break where the possessing spirit takes over, as the view is, then all that plasticity is ignored and like a whole different sort of facial structure arises. And this was supposed to be the window into the face of the person that's possessing you. And stomach six um, was used in this case as along with the inherent ghost points to clear that spirit from you quite interesting um, if you've never seen it it's quite a fascinating phenomena watching someone's face switch to like a face that just doesn't look like their own then we have uh, what have we got next Ren24 um, called Guisha or Cheng Jiang in TCM names with Guisha the ghost market uh, where's that Ren24 oh yeah it's the center of your what do you call that? A mentolobial groove. It's sort of halfway between your chin and your bottom lip in that dip right there. This is Ren24. Um, this is for uh, a ghost that called, what do they call that? A deviation of the face. It's almost like a semi-stroke, you know. So when the ghost is invaded, it causes sort of one side of the muscle to become, face to become more distorted than the other. It does it like a semi-stroke, you know. Um, and they use this point, Ren24, to... Uh, clear this kind of spirit out then we have pericardiomate lao gong most people know this uh, certainly you've done qigong you know where this is in the center of your palm right this is called gui ku the the ghost's hideout uh, there's some arguments isn't there about where lao gong is as a sidetrack because some uh, people believe it's in the center of the palm um, and in some chinese medicine textbooks they show it sort of one carpal bone over sort of in the dip between your index finger and your middle finger between the sort of um, second and third and metacarpal bones of your hands. And and so th this little variation, uh, if you've not seen that actually, go online and look up 
on Google, type in Lao Gong, a pericardiomate, and look at some different locations. I would be surprised that there's variation between the middle of the palm and over towards the thumb side of your hand, shall we say. And no one can agree where it is. And actually, it's because they're both right, because points move a little bit um, as you age. And prior to uh, puberty, um, when you're a kid, Lao Gong's not actually in the middle of your hand. It's over towards the uh, thumb side between the second and third metacarpal bones, as they often show online. But in adults, it moves, it shifts, and it's in the middle of your palm. So for adults, it's always in the center. Uh, and, and I don't think people know that always, that there's quite a few points like that on the body that shift according to your age. Um, they, will, they will change, they will move, you know. So this one is used if there's sort of spasms uh, or convulsions in the body uh, from the possessing spirit you know causing sort of i don't know what do you call it like seizures i suppose but on lesser lesser scale seizures that's a bit extreme typical of me straight to the extreme in it maybe not seizures you know shakes and spasms in the body and um, probably because pericardiomate is very good for releasing uh, anything from the body sort of stuck chi and pressures like releasing a, a valve isn't it to get that, that pathogen out of the body then we have Du-23, this is uh, Shangxing, this is called Upper Star, um, but it's called Gui Tang, the ghost hall within the ghost names of the points, those are the two names. It's one sun, so one thumb's thickness into your hairline, anterior hairline, so kind of on your center line of your, uh, quite high up on your forehead, just into your hair. Um, this is for when there's a ghost calling extreme mood swings, where people are swinging from absolute sort of anger through to happiness or whatever laughter and it's causing headaches uh, watering of the eyes and things like this and this this is used for that this would be often another point associated with wind as well actually sort of wind pathogen invading the body Gui Sang, uh, the one that i said could never be your inherent point this is ren one hui yin under on your perineum um basically uh, I, it's a funny one actually ren one is a, a point that i was always taught was kind of taboo to use um why you know, so perineum you know it's run you know where that is like halfway between your anus and your genitalia you know and I, obviously it's a bit taboo and you don't have many patients come in that you feel you can use that point particularly i, mean, I wouldn't feel that comfortable with it um and it's not actually as powerful as some people make out because though i say it's all i have used it needling um experimenting of course with the patient's permission and it's not as strong as some other points there's other points that are alternatives to ren one you know there's no real reason to use it and yet i find out recently that there's a lot of western colleges making all the acupuncturists needle it on each other and i find that and it's funny there's one college where i was talking to some of the students and they were saying like in the second year you needle ren one i think they were saying um, and there's this whole period of stress building up to that class because you're with strangers and they're going to needle ren one and they get all stressed about it and i just thought how fucking needless it really is i mean it's not actually that difficult to needle so if you wanted to you could go home use a mirror and practice on your own you know and but i just think it's needless stress for the sake of stress i think personally sometimes acupuncture teachers like to have a bit of a novelty you know what i mean it's like hey we're all gonna do rem one like they want to shock the students or something maybe just they're a bunch of perverts who knows but anyway ren one uh hui yin um so it's funny enough it's often listed as being very good for waking someone up from a coma <laughs> which i think is brilliant there's all sorts of ethical things isn't there about needling the perineum of someone in a coma to wake them up yeah sounds like legal problems doesn't it yeah but but they can be used for that um but it's also listed for a special type of spirit um why that was said to like sexually assault you that sounds bizarre doesn't it there was a belief in a type of spirit that would sexually assault <laughs> people in their sleep and steal their steal their jing steal their essence um you know it's probably a an old belief stemming from sort of early wet dreams or something like this erotic dreams wasn't it um, i would have thought and there was also there was a belief that was probably a bit sort of anti-feminist i suppose these days uh, where some of the old Taoist wizard believed that unscrupulous women could transform themselves into foxes and these fox demons would climb in through poor men's windows at night and then turn back into women like we're foxes and then rape you and steal your essence and then run off again that doesn't sound too likely i'm not overly convinced on that being a true story but there we go that was the belief of the time these evil fox women that stole your jing a bit of fear of women maybe there i'm not sure but but ren one was a point they would use for that i personally have not used it in the case of possessions i don't meet a lot of sexually abusive ghosts or fox women that steal your jing but you never know do you the world is a strange place 
These, this point was often used in con conjunction with the uh, Sir Shen Song. Sir Shen Song is, uh, means four upright or protective spirits, which is four points on the top of the head. Um, and they sit in a sort of uh, pattern, you know, like a, uh, four points around the crown of your head. I didn't explain that very well. You've got the crown of your head, there's Bai Hui, and surrounding in a four points called the four upright spirits. Each of them one has a correspondence to one of the elements. Um, with the, the Bai Hui being the earth element in the center. Front one is uh, metal. Uh, the Se Shen Song point to your right is the fire. Se Shen point Song point to the left of Bai Hui is water. And Song, Se Shen Song point behind Bai Hui is the fire point. So you've got all five elements on top of your head. Um, and basically, you're never supposed to needle all of these points together. Classically, you were never supposed to needle all, of the, all four points. You really weren't. Yeah, that would drain the body. Um, and, and I keep hearing acupuncturists using Sir Shen Song, like just putting all four points in together, or all five sometimes with Bai Hui, and they really shouldn't. Um, because often what happens is the patient will say they'll feel very calm after they've had all those points. But they're not calm, they're drained. Because if you needled all those points, it was contraindicated because it drained the body of energy because it was too confused because all of the elemental points were needled together. What was actually supposed to happen was one or two of those points according to which elements needed to be strengthened were needled on their own, meaning it wasn't five needles or four needles at a time, it was one or two usually put into the top of the head to strengthen the element um, that was essentially stopping you uh, from absorbing different spirit. No, you would strengthen the element you wanted to use to stop spirits coming into you. So without making it horribly complicated, because this is probably a very long rambling podcast already, is Gwei, ghosts were then divided into five types. There were yellow Gwei, white Gwei, black Gwei, green Gwei, and the other one. Did I say red Gwei? I'm not sure. But basically the colors that correspond to the five elements. And if a therapist could identify the type of Gwei, they would strengthen the Sir Shen Song, the relevant elemental point, to stop that element uh, of spirit coming into you and in the case of sexually abusive spirits not that I've ever treated any but in their belief system these ones that would would assault people during their sleep or fox demons stealing the jing they would actually need the water element so the left Se Sen Shong point along with Huai Yin on the base of the body to strengthen the water element to prevent um, black Gui which is what these Gui were from entering the, the body so even Se Shen Song is a very um, sort of very esoteric belief system to it. It's called four because there's four of them. Upright, as in upright, mean doesn't mean like sometimes you see it translated me upright because it's on top of the head, but it doesn't it means like virtuously upright, protective. You know, upright, up, upstanding points to guard you from things and spirits being spirits. So it was four points to uprightly defend you from different types of spirits entering the body. So very very esoteric the session song and definitely misused misused uh, quite often but but often the water element one would be used with ren one with hui yin which is why i was talking about it then we have gui chen this is large intestine 11 uh, what's sometimes called the pool at the bend but it's at the elbow um this is a sort of a general one for ghosts <laughs> it's boring isn't it this is one sort of you don't know what sort of ghost it is this point is used on the elbow it's also um Funnily enough, it's a point, people don't know this often, that's used for breaking connections to cults. That's odd, isn't it? There's a point for that. So if you had someone who's had a connection to a cult or a spiritual leader um, who they feel has had some kind of psychic connection over them, again, I have had patients say that kind of thing. I went, I was in this weird group. I felt like the teacher had this weird spiritual control over me. I want to sever it. Often what would happen, even though that's not a ghost, it's still a spiritual thing, they would have the inherent point needle plus large intestine 11 uh, stimulated according to the yin and yang hour of the day to break the connection to that teacher um, so that they, you know, cult escaping. What do you call that? Cult rescuing, cult deprogramming. What's that? There's a job. There's someone who goes in and becomes a cult deprogrammer, isn't there? What an odd job. How do you choose to do that? I'm a cult deprogrammer to, to talk people out of cults. I saw a documentary on them once and I thought, what an odd job. Like, do you have a business card? I mean, <laughs> Damo Mitchell, cult deprogrammer or something. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a, a lot of cool for it. Then the last one, Gui Feng, uh, the, the wind ghost. Obsessed with wind and ghosts, aren't they? You know, wind and ghosts. There's lots of correlations there. Um, and this was for very, very strong ghosts that have been carried through on wind. This was a very extreme one. And this is, unfortunately underneath your tongue either side of the 
Uh, oh, what do you call that? Is that the frenulum of the tongue? I'm not sure. The bit of skin that's under your tongue. So you roll the tongue up and the needles go in. You've got two points uh, called Yu Yu and Jin Jin, uh, which are either side of the frenulum in the tongue. The right hand one is called Yu Yu and the left hand one is Jin Jin. And what happens is when you put the needles into there, you stimulate them uh, and you bleed the tongue. You don't have to try hard. You put the needles in and the mouth just fills with blood. Uh, and as it fills, it's not very nice. You, know, you have to spit it out. You know. And when you needle that one, um, and the mouth fills with blood, it, it clears out uh, the, the wind ghosts, basically. Uh, it was considered a, a very, very strong point, so luckily one that's not used too often. The only thing that's unfortunate is if your um, earthly branch happens to be sur, okay, which is one of the 12 earthly branches, then that point under the tongue is your inherent ghost point, which means every time you have a ghost point train, you've got to have your underside of your tongue bled which is very unfortunate isn't it and that's people born in like 1965 1977 you know 1989 you know, those poor people there's a lot of them got a lot of people in my school born in 1989 for some reason so they would have to have the underside of their tongue uh, bled on every ghost treatment before they have the um, uh, other points put in as well poor people <laughs> i feel quite sorry for them let's hope they don't get possessed so maybe I'll leave it there. That's quite long considering I'm on my own, isn't it? That's one hour and what's that? Looking at the time. One hour and 20 minutes talking on my own. God, oh, what a madman. How do I do that? Just talking to myself in a very hot room as well. I'm in Portugal. I forgot to put the uh, air con on, so I'm now soaked in sweat. It's like I'm recording this sat in a sauna. That's not great, is it? I'm not going to get any sympathy, am I? I should just shut up. So that was the ghost points. Um, a sort of discussion of it. Hopefully it wasn't too bad for non-acupuncturists. Well, hopefully it wasn't too bad for acupuncture. I hope it wasn't boring. But I just thought I'd run down sort of some of the beliefs of ghosts and, and ghost points and things like that in Chinese medicine because I think they're quite an interesting uh, part of the treatment. And as I said, if you don't believe in them, that's all right. It doesn't matter. That's fine. But it's just quite cool, I think, to see some old beliefs and how they work. I mean, I even think that, that non-acupuncturists, you know, Qigong practitioners especially and Tai Chi practitioners, should get hold of a, an acupuncture book, um, a good historical one, if you like, or a point with really good understandings of the names of the points and read through them and look at them. Uh, or try to try to figure them out for yourself to understand the belief system, the alchemical beliefs that are people that formulated Chinese medicine. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And like I say, the more you understand the mindset of the founders, the more you get insight into your own art, you know, look to the root to understand the present uh, moment. So hopefully that's been a bit of an insight um, into it. For those of you who are after the earthly branch chart, acupuncturist mainly, I'm thinking, and you want to know how to use the ghost points or you want notes from this sort of talk, I suppose, if you go on the Scholar Sage website, um, www.scholarsage.com, Dot com. Did I put too many W's? www, three W's, you know what I mean, World Wide Web, www.scholarsage.com. Um, go on to the articles and hunt around, type in ghost points or something, you'll find there's an article on there, and I've put the, I wrote it ages ago, and I put the chart on there for the earthly branches. There's enough on there, combined with this podcast, um, to actually start using the ghost points in your treatments, if it's relevant, if you want to experiment with them a little bit, so give it a go, see what happens. Do some uh, exorcisms and See if you can get a job at the Catholic Church afterwards or something, I don't know. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.